Good morning, everybody. Welcome, uh, retail partners of GTS, to our um, very special Tuesday webinar featuring Mr. Don Reince of Chessex Manufacturing. Uh, he's a, a fixture in the industry, someone that uh, whose product you are I'm no doubt carrying and selling. And uh, he's here today to talk to us a little bit about his history in the industry, where he sees it going, and then also about Lab Dice, which I'm sure is why you're tuned in. Uh, just a, a quick note. Everyone who's in attendance today, all the stores, all of our retail partners will be receiving a uh, special gift package from Chessex directly. I'm getting a little bit echo, but we back off a little bit. Uh, and another just housekeeping note is that when you, if you have a question or you want to talk to Don uh, via the chat, feel free to just hover your mouse over the picture window over the screen and you'll see the little chat button down at the bottom. You can click on that and that'll get a message out to us. Uh, you have the option of, of sending that message only to the panelists and attendees or only to the panelists, which are Don and myself. So uh, feel free to do that. I don't think I introduced myself. I'm Scott Bohr, uh, the category manager for gaming specialty products, which covers dice, role-playing games and miniature games. So all the really fun stuff that comes with little fiddly bits. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Don Reince because I'm sure he's got a lot to share with us. Don? Well, hello. So I hope, I hope everyone can hear, hear me. Is audio okay? Yep. Sounds oh. good. Okay. So anyways, well, thanks for joining uh, me on the, this uh, GTS webinar. I'd also like to thank GTS for their support and the opportunity to speak with everyone here. Um, what I do is first go over a brief history of myself in the game industry as well as talk about the Lab dice future production, and then throw it out for, for, for questions if anyone has, it, has any. Um, first of all, I've been in the industry a long time. I started working in a retail store in, called The Gambit in Berkeley, California in 1979. Uh, in March of, around March of 1980, the owners told us they were not going to renew the leases in the store and we should, that they would be closing at the end of the year and we should start looking for other work. Um, you know, since I liked what I was doing, and, and not knowing any better, I decided I would start my own store, which I opened on June 5th, 1980. And it was called Games of Berkeley, which um, is still in business. Uh, you know, I'd like to, like, like to note. Um, when the Gambit closed at the end of the year, um, they gave me some of the fixtures um, uh, that they didn't need, which was very nice because at the time I didn't have any money, so it was really very helpful. Um, in 1981, I started the Berkeley Game Company with Bill Lamb, who was one of the former owners of the Gambit. And one of our first products was the Battlemat, which um, is still in business, along with their bigger brothers, uh, the Mega Mat and the, and the Mondo Mat. Um, in 1982, I started Berkeley Game Distributors. And you probably notice a kind of like a common theme here in, in Berkeley, California. But anyways, uh, in 1984, the first Chessies product was sold, and they were chess clocks, which I imported from Germany because at the time the the um, the Deutschmark was very weak against the dollar, so they were cheap enough to where I could buy it and resell them. Um, the uh, for any, for just for your information, I'm not really a role player or a historical gamer or a miniature gamer. My gaming creds comes really from playing in chess tournaments and back end tournaments, um, and that's kind of like where the name Chessix came from because it was a combination of Chessix and other classic games. Um, anyways, Chessix made various game accessories, and in 1987 we started to offer dice. Um, uh, in 1987, I started Chessex East, which was doing distribution as well as selling our products. Um, in 1988, I sold Berkeley Game Distributors. In 1990, I started Chessex Midwest, which is also a distributor. And I started to buy dice from a factory in Denmark. Um, and that was critical for me because very shortly thereafter, we developed the Speckle Dice, which were very popular and kind of like, you might say, put us on the map. Um, we also developed that year we were the first company to start putting the four on the four side die on the top of the die as opposed to the bottom. So, so people no longer had to read the bottom of the D4. I mean, I, I remember watching people roll 10 D4s at a gaming convention and having to move all the, the four side dice so they could, they could total up the numbers. And I thought, no, this doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, in 1993, I think it was 1993, we came out with a 10 10 die to help prevent arguments um, about which color die was the tens digit and which was a single digit when people were rolling percentiles. Um, then uh, in 2000, I, I visited the German dice factory and started to make new colors of them, which is the, the factory that makes all the real nice ones, which they're doing so far all the lab dice. Um, so um, the market has seen a huge increase the last like 
10 years, which is great. Um, and I'm very appreciative because it's allowed me to continue on doing what I like to do, which is like create new colors and such. Um, the, la the, the past couple years has been kind of tough on me because um, the, about 19, sorry, about 2015, 2016, we started out outstrip the, 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 the capacity of the, uh, sorry, outstrip in sales, the capacity of the factory to produce. So at that point, we stopped producing uh, any more any more dice um, or any more new dice, um, and uh, um, um, so it's something that uh, that it was kind of rough on me because I was creating all these nice dice, but I couldn't bring them out because because we made a conscious decision that it was better to try to focus on keeping the dice we had in, on the shelves in stock rather than steal production from from uh, the existing products to come out with new colors just to have out of stocks because what my experience has been out of stocks by the publisher are one of the worst things that can happen because the distributor and the retailer cannot make money from an out of stock. As a matter of fact, it costs you money. So we focus on doing, um, you know, doing existing colors. Um, then, but now what's happened is that last year, the, 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 the factory here in Germany was sold to new owners. Um, now I could complain about the former owner not wanting to expand their production to come out with more product, but he was in his mid nineties and he's a really nice person and a very good person. And so I'll never say anything really negative about him at all. Um, but it was obvious why he didn't want to expand out the, uh, um, uh, his, his factory because he was 95 years old. Um, so the new owner is around 40. Okay. Um, and they want to invest and expand their capacity. This last year, they, they claimed, that they produce 80% more than was produced for me in 2017. Um, and this, this gave us the opportunity to bring out some of the new dice that we brought out in Dice Manager number 10 earlier this year. Uh, and and uh, um, that left me with a question of what would I do next after that? Um, in the past, when we've done new colors, what we've done is we've, we've tested them out at shows because not every color we come out with is a, is a jade scarab or um, purple teal um, Gemini color. There's, there's so many colors that's, you know, you can have a good idea on what a good color is, but you're never always sure. So it's always best to test it out first. But I've never really liked the, the format that we've done where we've, um, where we've tested it at shows and then based on what we sell at shows, say, ah, oh, this is a good color, let's bring it out. Uh, the main reason I haven't liked it is that I, I just don't feel that it's really fair to the distributors and the retail stores. Um, one of the things that um, I don't like to do is to put my customers in a position of having to say no to their, to their customers. And if we have something at a show that we're only selling at shows, then someone buys it, goes back home to their friend to see it and say, oh, can you get me this? You have to tell them no. I just never really like doing that. Um, but it was a situation where... Um, it kind of like developed that way, and um, we we we, we kind of try to figure out what we could do in a format that could include the distributors and retailers in our like our market research, and that is what we came up what we came up with, with are the lab dice, um, and the the key points to the lab dice are that um, it's not a collectible item, um, you know we're we're doing a shorter produ production run, okay, but. Uh, we're trying to make it so it, it fills the initial capacity of the marketplace. Um, we are then holding some back for shows and mail order. And once the retailers and distributors sell out, if there's a, if there's a demand for the, that color, we will see it in sales at shows or in our mail order. So from that, we can determine, ah, this is a good color. Um, and uh, um, so that is, a, you know, so um, that is, um, you know, instead of trying to figure out what will sell well on the front end, we're trying to do it on the back end. Um, the other thing is that um, um, with the uh, um, um, with the with the lab dice, we can get more of the product out there, and so we have a better, you might say, oh, uh, sampling you might say of what's going to be a good color. Because just doing it at a show is not really enough. Because some people, you know. Selling to maybe a few thousand people at a show and see what they like is not the same as selling to the whole marketplace. Um, so, um, so that's basically the um, the concept of the, of the lab dice. Um, now, I should say the first couple um, 
um, land rights release, the, the response has been a little overwhelming. It, it, I don't know if, how much you know about making dice, but it takes a long time to get it made. The first lab dice release, which we got out, I think it was in July, um, was um, ordered in February. So it takes like four to six months. Well, a lot can happen four to six months. Um, and on the second group of lab dice, I did increase the order for the first one, but it was not enough. So we're going, so we went back and made some more. So we, that would be the second wave. Um, although what, what kind of really happened was that more were supposed to be made and the factory kind of like, like missed one or two shapes. Um, and uh, so we couldn't come out with as many as we wanted to because we didn't have one shape. Um, we had limiting factor dice. So when they said, oh, we'll go back and make some, I said, well, can you make some of these other ones and we, we can do more. So that's kind of what happened. So those will probably be out, I think sometime in early November. I know they're working on it, but um, um, they also had to stop a little bit of production because there are some dice they were running out of our normal colors that I had to have them make first so it wouldn't run out of those. But I think that the next group of, or the second wave of the second group of lab dice will be out in the early part of November. And the, the next, uh, the third group, which are gonna be Gemini colors, will probably be out in the early part of December. Um, they're fairly far along in, in that production. Um, and so, yeah. Uh, now on the packaging, we went, we went with those blue caps, um, but what we decided to do is since they're lab dice, that we really should come out with test tubes. So uh, this is just Boreal's teal, but so it's gonna be kind of in this format in the future. Um, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna make this display out of, it's a cardboard display. And I have one here that I can put up here so you can see it, okay. That holds, I guess it holds um, 12, 12 tubes. Um, and then uh, hopefully what will happen is that um, we will, um, you know, replenish it more with, um, you know, with, with more lab dice releases and things of that nature. Um, we probably will not be doing a display where I get like two of each as a, as a sampler because we're just, you know, what do we do in an allocation situation if we have it, uh, which we've already had. So it's something that, uh, um, that I should point out uh, too, that on the, uh, um, on the allocation side, I really don't like allocation. Um, sorry for the noise. Um, I really, you know, my feeling is that if someone's gonna order it, I don't want anyone to play allocation games, we will get to that order eventually. So, um, you know, it's, you know, we, we take the or people's orders seriously. Um, and I lived through the, all the magic allocations, all the collectible card things. And I just, I just don't like playing that game that much. And so generally our attitude is that if, um, if you order it, we will get it for you. Um, so that's about it for the lab dice. So, so I should say that on these tubes, the next re release, uh, which is going to be the, or the, or the, sorry, the Gemini release will be, will still be with the boxes with the, uh, blue caps. The, the, this will be the the uh, um, um, the, the, the uh, um, packaging for the fourth group, the, the fourth release of the lab dice. Um, for, for the future, um, the, the German dice factory is actually building a new facility. Um, the, this this factory is very old. Um, it was built around 1951, I think, um, maybe 49, and it's kind of like a hodgepodge. Right now, I think they're making the dice over about seven locations throughout the city. Um, cause they, we, cause we really have kind of like outgrown what this factory was, was meant for. So the new owners are building a new factory and put it, be able to put everything under one roof. And they're going to probably have about double the number of machines they have right now, which means they probably could more than double their, their capacity. Um, cause having, I mean, I think they put like, like, 50,000 miles on this van going between the different locations and no place is more than like a half a mile away from any, any of the other place. But um, so it's something that um, that's coming down probably on the middle part of 2021. Um, and I should tell you right now too, I probably have about 20 really good colors that I would love to get out just as a normal release and probably about 60 that could be in the, that I'm not really certainly, certainly, you know, not really certain about as far as how well they'll do, they'll be in like the lab dice format. So I think that you probably can expect to see at least 30 new colors from us, um, you know, every, you know, every year, if not more. Um, the dice factory in Denmark um, is also wanting to bring out some new, new speckle dice colors. And we're working on developing some new speckle colors too. 
the first since like 1994. Um, and um, um, I should point out too that the, um, sadly the, the owner of the German, oh, sorry, the, the, the Danish dice factory uh, passed away last year suddenly and his son's taken over. Um, and I really cannot stress to everyone how important that factory was because when I made contact with them in 1990, um, doing the speckled dice, um, putting, you know, getting the, 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 the four side up on the, on the top, we were, we were a very good team and, you know, did a lot of innovative and a lot of interesting things. And it got me started on doing more and more and focusing more and more on dice. And I'm always wondering what would, what, what would the dice market be like today if I never would have made contact with the factory and never really got into like making dice? Would someone else have come in and, you know, done the same thing as, as I would have? Um, you know, I, I guess we'll never know, but it is one of those things where um, I was very sad to he hear his passing, um, but happy to hear that his son has decided to take over and he's, uh, um, you know, wanting, he's um, like 30 years old and he's uh, wanting to do new things and carry on in, in, in the tradition and such. I'm very happy for it because I think they make a great product and um, the, the material they use for, the, for the, the opaque and the speckled dice, being that it's a higher density, um, gives very flat surfaces, is very good for making dice. And I'm very glad that, that he's, uh, um, you know, going to continue with the, uh, um, you know, with the tradition, of, uh, you know, of his family because his father took over from his father and such. So he's like third generation and such. So um, I guess that's really about it. Um, so does that, anyone have any questions? Yeah, let's go ahead and um, we can open it up for questions. Any, anybody's got uh, something they want to ask Don about or, or uh, take a look at. Um, I, I do have a couple of questions, but first I'm going to let, uh, I'm going to let the retailers kind of come out with their questions first. And I'll just tell a little story about how I met Don. Uh, I, I'm fairly new to, uh, to some of this, uh, this work here. And uh, I've been doing the, we're managing the dice category for about a year. And I got last year, uh, or this last Gen Con, I got was my first opportunity to go to Gen Con. And that's where I, I met and had a meeting with Don. And uh, he's an incredibly personable guy. If you, if you get a chance to meet him, um, you should take that opportunity because he's a great guy. And it looks like we do have a question, so I'm going to cut my story short. I'll be back to that. But Tabitha is asking, what is the state of your custom dice program? Uh, when you say state, what do you mean state? Are, are you still running the custom dice program? What it is what I assume, or well, are you talking about like, like doing laser engraved dice? I believe so. It sounds like that's the direction. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, no, we're still doing it. Uh, uh, Joe and the crew are, are are very busy back there. Um, as a matter of fact, we're uh, one of the nice things about the um, the the factory in Germany is that uh, they're also interested in doing laser engraving, and um, we can also. Uh, we're, we're looking into um, doing different kind of molding to be able to do, um, uh, well, I really can't go into too, too much detail because I could talk to you for hours about it, but um, we're, we're looking into like making a mold to where you can change individual sides, okay, that would not be as highly detailed as the laser engraving, but it would be a lot less expensive to, to have made. Um, the one of the problems they have laser engraving is that someone will come because the, they're all hand done. So we, we laser them and then we hand paint them. Well, you can only paint about 100 an hour. So we get an order for, let's say, 8,000 dice. Well, all of a sudden there's 80 hours soaked up by someone. And that puts all of the other orders behind. Okay. So, um, um, so the other thing, too, is that if we could, um, we're toying with the idea of like right now we buy the dice from the factory with a blank side and then engrave it and hand paint it. Well, the factory thinks that they can paint the, paint the dice after it's been engraved. And so the idea would be that we would make the dice, not paint them, engrave them, and then paint them and then polish them. And that would make that a machine process as opposed to being a hand process. If that was the case, not so much for small orders, but for large orders, it'd be a lot faster and less expensive. So, we're looking very much in, you know, into doing that. Um, and if that happens, then the, on the custom side, as far as doing the hand painting, um, this would be for the like orders like, like 3,000 or more. Um, but if we didn't have those orders, then the normal 
hand painting and such would be a lot faster. Um, I don't know if that uh, responds to the person's uh, question, uh, you know, but um, I, I think that's what they're trying to get at. She does have a follow-up. Tabitha um, has a follow-up here where she says, is there a lengthy delay on orders for custom engraved dice at the moment? So what's the delay like? If someone places an order today, when, when do they expect to get the dice? Right. I, I, th I think that I was talking to Joe like two weeks ago, and it was like eight weeks. So it is kind of long. Um, and again, this is, this is why I think that, I mean, this is what we're looking into, trying to relieve all these big orders that just kind of like block up the system. It's, it's sort of like, you know, if, if GTS gets like a $2 million order from someone, you know, they probably would like you know, take up some of their time. I'm sure you get those every, every month or two, right? Sure. Yeah, all the time. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it, is, it's, it is a bit of a problem. Um, now, what they, they do is they try to get some orders in between. So it's not like they get this one large order and then they just stop doing everything else. But, I, but it, it is kind of like a long time. Um, so, I mean, I think that Joe does very good work. So the, the best thing to do is just to get in the queue and then it, it, it'll get done. Um, and again, it's, um, there's also somewhat of a capacity issue because, um, um, you know, I want to use this factory for those dice for the laser engraving because they're, they're, they're the nicest dice. Um, but again, it takes a long time to get the, made, the dice made. And we are, luckily we have a lot of colors. So if you don't have this red, we have another red that might work or this blue or, or that blue. But we do have an issue sometimes of actually not having enough dice to actually engrave on. Um, it's, not, it's, it's not as bad as it was, but sometimes there is a bit of a problem, a problem on that. You know, on, on that side. Um, but I, th I think the last I heard was like bouncing between six and eight weeks. Great. And Michael Fortino has a comment here. He says, thanks for making awesome dice. Can't wait to see the new styles and happy to hear about production increases. Thanks for taking the time. Oh, so, thanks for that. It, you know, I'm, I, you know, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> Seriously. And we do have some more questions. Uh, Jasper Humbert says, will you be making the D6 blocks for future waves? When the dice are chosen to be permanent, will the D6s be added for the future? Uh, no, we probably, won't, we probably won't do the 16 millimeter D6 with spots because um, the problem with them is that it's hard to, to know how many to buy because um, we did the bags of 50 because, well, what happened was that I placed the order for those for the, uh, um, for the first lab dice. And they just assumed I wanted the same quantity of the 16 millimeter six high dice with spots. And I was like, uh, is that on the purchase order? Well, no, <laughs> uh, but they made them anyway. So here they were, and, and we couldn't really, um, we, we couldn't really just make them available as dice blocks um, because we would sell out too quickly. Um, by doing the bags of 50, we sold fewer and we had enough for everyone. So we're not really planning on doing uh, for like the, the Gemini or further future ones, we won't be doing any six iodized with spots. If we do come out with a color as a normal color, yes, we do it in all the shapes, um, in the 12 millimeter and 60 millimeter D6 dice blocks, just like a normal release. Okay, and then uh, following up on that, uh, Becky Alexander says, when will you decide to make a lab set into a permanent part of the collection? A lot of it is just based on how well it sells. Um, uh, like uh, like I already, we already announced that, um, Nebula Nocturnal will be an, a normal color in the future, okay? Um, and because that one sold really, really well. Um, on this release, we have some, I have some sneaking suspicions of which ones will be, okay? And we were doing some uh, testing on some other Nebula colors, which, which um, one of them I think is like really, really nice. Um, and we'll probably won't even do a lab dice on that one. They'll probably just come, out, come straight out as a normal color. Um, you know, and like I said, you know, not everything is going to be in the lab dice range. If it's a color that we think is really, really good, we will just come out with it as a normal, as a normal release. Okay. Um, so I wouldn't say that the, that the lab dice colors are the ones where we, we, th we don't think are good enough. It's more like uh, the lab dice colors are the ones that we're unsure of. I mean, the thing is that, I mean, all, you know, I should, maybe I should have showed a picture of upstairs here where I have all our, the boxes of samples, because um, we're up to like 1,420 now as far as uh, uh, sample colors that we've done. Um, and uh, what happens is that 
you know, there's been a lot of colors in the past that I just didn't, wasn't sure about, like uh, Festive Water Lily is the example. We, we came out with it last year as a test color to show because I really liked that color. You know, I liked it when I made it, but I was just really unsure if, if anyone else would. Well, we, we have a numbering system. It's, it's CS, which stands for chess example, and then a number, and they're sequential. Or, well, we're up to like 1400 or something right now, okay? The, the, the water lily color was CS209. So that was like from 10 years ago. Um, uh, Vortex Bright Green, which we brought out in 2015 or 2016, I can't remember. Um, that, that one actually predated the CS system. That was first, um, we first, I first designed that color in 2005. So, you know, it's, it's like we have so many colors that we're just unsure about that, that, you know, I don't really want to bring it out and put it in the market because I'm always worried about, um, well, from my experience as a retailer and a distributor, um, I, I have to say that not every product that I bought or that has been, been uh, released by a publisher or a manufacturer has sold really, really well. Uh, you know, um, even, even though there are claims from the publisher otherwise. Um, so I'm always very, very concerned about coming out with colors that will just sit on people's shelves. So when I, when I come out with stuff, it's, it's, it's things I really, really strongly feel will do well. Um, so some of these colors, like, like Festival Water Lily and, and, and Pop Art, um, um, are colors that I really liked, but I wasn't sure how well they do in the marketplace. But we, we kind of shows they do well there and brought them out, and they've been very popular. Um, so it's something that, uh, um, that um, there's really no set thing. It's more like what the reaction is. And that's one of the nice thing about the Lab Dice and about shows is that you get, a, and now with social media, because if you get a lot of chatter from it, you get a lot of pictures of it on Instagram and such, you probably have a good idea. You know, I think people like this color and stuff. And again, and also too, part of it is just the capacity issue at the factory. Got it. Okay. Uh, the next comment is, uh, our customers love these lab dice, by the way, and would you be able to send retailers images of your upcoming dice so we can get pre-orders and generate interest? So if there's an image set that you could send along to a distri distribution to send out, or if you want to send it direct to retail, that's... Right, yeah, well, what well, we have, well, the, 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 I would love to, but the, the but um, I kind of have an experience at the this recent Gamma Trade Show with, with well, it's, it's, it's no secret that there's more and more dice coming out of China. Um, and um, I, so, I had some samples of ideas that I had for the future at the Gamma Trade Show. And then there was uh, um, some guy with a t-shirt from one of my, one of the, the Chinese dice uh, companies taking pictures of all of our samples. So I said, you know, that's kind of uncool. Um, so I said, so I kind of made the plan that that we're probably just not going to like release colors until in a couple of weeks before the release, and I hate doing it that way. But at the same time, too, I don't want to come up with a, doing all the research, coming up with a color, and then have someone copy it quickly. So, um, so that's if we're not doing it, that's the reason why. So I apologize, but I kind of like want to protect our, how just you know our uh, intellectual property as much as I can. Um, so I figure that in, in, a, in like a three week time no one can like produce it and get out in the marketplace before we do. Right. Um, there is an, a request for clarification on the D6 cubes. Uh, I think you said that if, if those lab dice do go into your main production line, you would then come back in with D6 cubes as well? Oh yeah, definitely, yeah. Yeah, both the 12 and 16 millimeter, no, no, absolutely no question. Okay, but nothing, uh, nothing for the lab dice line. For now, those are just going to be the seven counts, like you've, like you've been right. doing. Right. Okay. Yeah, because I mean, it, it, you know, I mean, it's no, it's no secret. That's where most of the sales are in, in the, in the role playing market. Right. Uh, Becky Alexander and, also and asks. Another, yeah, and the other thing too is that if there's just one less shape that they have to make, that's, that's just one less, that's just a little faster that I can get the product out into the marketplace. Right. Certainly. Um, Becky Alexander asked, also asked, would you be willing to publish a poll, select retailers to see which colors they feel would sell well in their stores? So would you want to do a poll or that's kind of what you're doing with the lab dice in a way? It's, it's kind of what we're trying to do. Yeah. And uh, um, 
yeah, and and uh, you know, and and through sales, I guess, really is kind of the way the way of trying to do it. And yeah, and, and effectively, it is kind of like a poll. Um, but I always felt that, um, um, you know, I guess Scott probably has a little experience of this being a buyer that you don't really listen to the publisher and what sells well. You listen to <laughs> the, the the consumers willing to spend that hard earned money to actually get the product. <laughs> Yes, we've had experiences both ways on that one. Yeah, right. So, but but the thing is that I mean, okay, I should I should point out too that um, it's it's also no secret that um, our you know we don't exactly have a web page, <laughs> and I probably should address that a bit. It's kind of like it's a somewhat funny story. We are we are, are actually working on it right now, and we probably have about two thirds of the pictures done uh, by now. But the the main reason why we don't have a good web page. And also why we took so long to get the um, UPC codes onto um, our products was simply that I was very much afraid of getting into an overtrading situation because I knew the factories couldn't make more. And you know, by putting barcodes on the on products and by having a better web page, that will help increase your sales. Well, it doesn't help us any if if like last year, you know, we were down to giving like a 75 or 80% fill ratio, which I thought was just I mean, it was alarming. It was just, it, it, it bothered me no end. Well, it'd be worse if, if I had a good web page and had barcodes to increase our sales by 25%, because then I would, would be getting a 60% fill ratio, which would be even worse. So now with the factory being able to produce more, um, I feel much more confident that, okay, it's now time to get involved with a little more, you know, um, um, direct, you know, a little more marketing and a little more information about the product to try and increase the sales because we can probably match the production, you know, to it. I mean, it's it's kind of been a juggling act, and maybe I'm trying to to overthink the whole process. But um, I I can remember so many times in the past when you couldn't get product, and it was just so frustrating because here you are, you're you're paying your overhead for your store, your staff, and you can't get Trivial Pursuit or you can't get you know, the Ruby's cube where you can't get whatever is really hot at that time. You know, this, this is probably, this, this may be before some of the people who are watching were even born, <laughs> but, but those were, those were um, uh, very, uh, um, oh, those are my, my formative years uh, in the industry. And I remember those days and I, I want to do whatever I could to, or whatever I can to, to avoid them. So it's better to have, uh, I feel it's better to have a high fill ratio on smaller sales that have a terrible fill ratio and have greater sales. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Tabitha Simmons asks, thank you for the info. Any plans to make D100s? You know, if I, if I had the time, I, I, part of it is that, I mean, you know, going back, I mean, Uncle Lou, I should also point out too that on the, when we did the, the tens 10 die, it was really kind of a funny story. I showed up at the Gamma Trade Show and, uh, um, we didn't have the mold made yet, but it was about a week away. And there Lou had his Decatur, his double zero through 90. So literally we came up with the same idea at the same time. And I got a die, I got a sample die the, the, the week later and I sent to Lou. So he knew that I wasn't copying his idea. Cause he says, you know, there's no way you can make a mold in a week. Okay, so they take months. Um, so, um, so we did it at the same time. And, and part of it is I haven't really focused on doing the D100 because out of respect for Lou. Um, that we don't want to like step on his toe because that was his idea and stuff like that. But I, you know, it's something that, um, and I think someone, someone has made a D100, haven't they? But it may be just a big golf ball that yeah. was a solid, solid core. So it's not really very good. Um, it's something that we're looking in. And I can also I tell you too, with this, um, with, with the factory here in Germany wanting to do more things, as well as the people in Denmark wanting to do more things. Um, you know, it, once we can solve the production issue, um, I have a whole slew of specialized dice I really want to do. Um, so, you know, it's like, it's like I'm, I wouldn't say chopping at the bit, so to speak, but it's kind of like, you know, I'm just kind of like, you know, sitting on this thing. It's like the, uh, um, it's like, it's like a luminary material for the, the glow in the dark stuff. You know, I, you know, I first discovered that, I think it was like, like a little over two years ago but couldn't bring out to now because there was no capacity to do it, you know? So, uh, um, so, you know, the D100, um, um, and then also, um, well, just a lot of specialized dice. They're, they're, you're on my docket, you might say, 
but it's just a matter of just production capacity. Uh, but the D100 doing it with this, the, 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 um, the two halves fused together and such requires a special machine. And, uh, um, you know, we, we might do it. Um, but it's, again, it's, I'm kind of focused on the lab dice and just the normal things to try to, you know, get things up. And, and when there's some spare time and capacity, that is definitely one of the things we're looking into, yes. Um, Jeff Beck writes, thank you so much for all you do. Our customers definitely prefer Chessex over any other dice, leading us awesome. to exclusively carry Chessex for the last 12 months. So there's 12 months of, of only Chessex dice. In oh, great. Well, thank you very much. Um, and, that's, and, that, and that's one of the reasons why I try to keep all the things in the shelves, because it's nothing worse than, you. because, I mean, way back in the day, one of the reasons why I got involved in dice because back then, um, the only dice companies were like on the East Coast. Um, and it wasn't that they were bad, but they would like to take, the shipping wasn't as quick. So it'd take like two weeks to get an order. And then you get an order and you only have half of what you want. And of course they don't have red, they don't have black, you know, they have everything else. They have, they have pink and they have, you know, brown and they have yellow, but they don't have the colors you want. And it's very frustrating. So, uh, um, um, you know, thank you very much for, for, for your support. And just let, let you know that we're really focused on trying to keep the things on the shelves. And I think Scott will attest to that, that our, our fill ratios are pretty, are usually pretty good, aren't they? Yes, they're very good. Yeah, much better than they have been in the past. Yeah, and you at this point, you probably wish all your suppliers had this kind of fill ratio. I'll, re I'll re withhold comment on that. <laughs> So uh, Michael Fortino says, any plans to fill in your 20 millimeter, 30 millimeter, and 50 millimeter D6s for existing production dice? Yeah, well, basically we, you know, the, the problem with those, the first one, the, the, the pro well, the, the problem on the 50 millimeters, again, is a production issue. I finally, I finally, you might say, read the Riot Act, June of this year, when my orders from 2017 had not been filled. <laughs> so, so, so part of the problem is, 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 first of all, on the 50 millimeter six sided dice, they're very expensive. Uh, actually, the 30 mils are pretty expensive too. Um, but they take a real long time to get made. Okay, I mean, a normal die, the cycle time is about, like on a translucent dice, like two minutes. I think on the 50 mils, it's like 15, okay? And they can only make like one or two at a time because they're so big and so much, more, so much material, okay? So they're re they really tie up a machine, okay? So they don't like doing it because they, they don't make so much money off of that versus normal stuff. That's the first problem. The second problem is, especially on the 50 mils, they get a lot of uh, second quality ones, small cracks or whatever, okay? Um, um, so, um, so it's, it's like they have taken a long time in the, in the mold and they um, get a high rate of, of defects. Okay, so they don't really like doing it. Um, so, so the other problem with those things is they're very expensive uh, because of those two reasons. And so when we sell them, I mean, you know, our, our margins are not very high on those at all because um, those things should be about a $25 to $30 retail based on what I'm paying for them. But I know they wouldn't sell at that at that rate, so I don't do it. But but um, um, the only, well, actually tell you the only reason I carry the fifty millimeter fifty millimeter dice is because the former uh, general manager who's now retired, every single time he came over here, which is like like five or six times a year, um, he'd say, "Oh, you should carry these fifty millimeter dice. They are so pretty." Um, like um, I had one around here. Ah, here here it is. Okay. Ta da like one of like like one of these guys. Okay. So they are they're very pretty. And we do have them at shows and they are great show pieces. Okay, because they really can it brings out the, the fluidity of the material and such. So they really are very nice, but they're very expensive. And um and the factory doesn't make them very often. Um and because they're just of a capacity issue. Now when they have the new factory and they can increase their capacity. No problem. We can get we can get get more of them made and such. Um, the thirty mils and the fifty mils are probably carried, but I probably will not carry the twenty. I will not carry the twenty millimeter in the future. And the reason for that is because on the thirty and fifty millimeters, I don't have to have so many made. I can turn them over in about a year and a half. With a twenty millimeter, I made them about ten years ago, and I still have like 
most of the colors in stock because they have to buy so many. Their minimum order for that, that size is so much that it makes it so I, I really can't, you know, I can't turn them over uh, fast enough because uh, I think that, you know, you know, Scott or any retail store would say, you know, turning over a, a product you buy once every like 15 or 20 years is not a product you really want to focus your, you know, your business on. Um, the, the 30 to 50 millimeters are, are much better. And those we pretty much come out with, um, we haven't really promoted them through distribution as such because of their cost and we have to sell them at a net price. And I, I really like to see, I mean, I, being a, a coming through the retail and the uh, distribution chain into the business, I really want, um, and knowing the need for retailers and distributors to make a profit, I, I want to make sure that um, that they have, have some margin to live off of. So I kind of like, you know, not focus on the 30 millimeters that much because there's not a lot of margin in it to, to, to when you get them sold. But we do sell them at a net price. Again, I don't like net pricing because I like it. I, I like the simplicity of saying, this is a retailer. This is a retail. This is your discount. This is your cost. And when you get too many net items in there, it just kind of like confuses everything. And I think it hurts the rest of, rest of the range. Um, but I think that for the most part, um, anything that's available in a normal range um, is available in the uh, 50 and 30 millimeters. But I should say that a lot of colors that are not as popular, we don't really, so we may make it the first time when we come with color, but then we don't go back and make, make more. Like Gemini red, green, I didn't make any more after the initial uh, amount. We just ran out of the 30 millimeters uh, six-sided dice. So it's something that, um, uh, I probably have dragged this on too, too long already, but well, let's say the long and short of it, um, I haven't focused on it because of the capacity at the factory. If there was ample ca capacity, I'd probably be much more attentive to them and try much harder to keep on the, on the stock. But when your factory takes two years to make something and you have to yell at them like three or four times to get them to make it, it kind of like puts a damper on your, your desire to keep it in stock. Okay, Jasper has a question that's very, uh, very similar along the same line. So I think it's probably a very similar answer, and that is um, regarding oversized D20s. Do you have plans to to make D20s in either the traditional pattern? These are oversized, right? Oversized D20s in the traditional patterns that you've already been making, or with a spin down pattern. Yeah, um, the, the issue. I do want to do spin down D20s. The issue is. Um, 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 in Denmark, where we do the 34 millimeter 20s, it's getting the darn mold made. Okay, um, um, the, the because the owner passed away so suddenly, um, the the transfer of the factory is not complete yet to to him because he has some um, half brothers and half sisters, and, and I'm not I'm not going to say it's messy because it's not. It just takes time to go through through the whole probate and everything. Um, so I know that when that ends, which is hopefully will be finalized sometime in the early part of next year, it takes a long time, then, then we'll get like maybe a, um, like a, a spin down mold uh, for there. The problem with the, the, the spin down and the larger 20 side dice at the German dice factory is the cost. Um, they're a lot more expensive to make the bigger, to make the bigger dice. And, I'd like to do them, um, but it's something that I'm going to um, I'm going to address with the new owners when um, when the time is right. You might say, which basically is when there's more capacity to get the things made. Um, I think that they they definitely want to they, they definitely want to do it. It's just a matter of cost and and time and things of that nature. I mean, I mean, you know, I, I should complain to people like Scott and all the retailers here because they're giving us so many orders, is keeping the factory so busy, we can't, we, we have a hard time doing new things. But don't stop buying the dice. <laughs> you know? So um, it, it's, kind of, it's kind of that, it's really kind of that issue more than anything else, is that um, they are, they truly, I mean, you know, it, it's, you know, th this can't be done because the, the factory has secrets, okay, on how they make the stuff and such, they don't want people in here. But, you know, it's just, I mean, it's, it really is. Before they um, move the factory, I want them to take like a video of someone walking through this place because it really, it's like a rabbit warren. 
I mean, it took me about a year and a half not to be able to get lost when I started, when I walked through this building. <laughs> because it started out as one building, they'd done like three additions, and there's three, what, there's actually, um, yeah, three stories in an attic. So it's easy to get lost. I mean, um, you know, the, uh, the, this, this place is not pallet jack friendly, I can tell you that. And then uh, there's there's one last comment that's in the in the queue right now. So if there are more questions, go ahead and, and feel free to answer or put them in there, uh, either in the chat window or the Q and A. Chat's a little easier to find. But um, Drew Schwab writes, "I want to thank you as a player. I've been using only Chessex dice since I was a teen in the '90s, and I'm glad I get to carry them as a store owner. I also want to say that I really appreciate listening to how you choose to operate. Not only do I have appreciation for the product." but I have respect for you as a business person. And uh, I, I agree with Drew entirely. Oh, okay. uh, great respect for, for what you're doing in the industry and, and how you conduct uh, your business through Chessex. Yeah, well, basically what it is is that, I mean, my background, besides being a chess player and a backhand player, is chemistry and physics. So obviously, that's a great background for business. Um, and really, it's just, I mean, I tell people, the only reason I survived in business is I made most of my mistakes when I was very small, okay? Um, and that I learned, and, I, and, and you always, is true in chess too, you learn more from your mis mistakes than from your successes. It was just, in my case, I tried a lot of things when I was very small. So when I was making mistakes, they were on the orders of 20 and 50 and $100, rather than 20, 50 and $100,000. So I made a lot of mistakes um, and developed a lot of things saying, you know, this is the way I think is. It, it, it's best for the market and for everyone, um, as well as for myself. Because I really, I really think that that the way you make money, the way you make it in, enduring money, is you make sure that the people around you um, also do well. And when they, um, um, and when when they do well, um, you'll do well because they'll keep on coming back to you for more. Basically, it's like it's like you make your money on the rebound as opposed to the to the, as opposed to the first push which I guess I might say is one of the reasons why I don't do a lot of like front end marketing. Cause I, I just think that it, if you have a good product, you'll get the, you'll get the money eventually. Um, and you know, there's, there's no reason to push a product on someone if it's good. So I, I try to put most of my effort into trying to make the product as best I possibly can. We don't always succeed, but you know, overall, I think that, you know, we, we don't have a bad track record. Great. Excellent. Uh, I do have a, a quick question myself for you on the lab dice, it's partic particularly for the display. Are, are you planning on, on putting that out as just a, a for purchase item, or is it going to be something where you order X amount and you can get the display as a free add-on, or what's your or, plan? What, what we're probably going to do is, just like we do with the existing um, uh, cardboard displays, we'll have a retail price on them, but we'll probably do something where, you know, like, you know, initially, like give it to the distributors like yourself and sort of say, hey, anyone ordering this much product can get one free. You know, so we'll get some out, for, some out free. Uh, you know, we, um, um, we, we don't have it completely formulated, but we're, we're not, um, it's sort of like we don't, I don't mind giving away things free, um, but I don't do it generally because when we give away things free, they usually just end up in a, in a, in a corner someplace and never get used. If you put some value on it, then all of a sudden it, it, people will, will, you know, will, will pay a little bit of money for it and then they'll actually, will, will use it for what it was intended for. Um, um, so it's something that uh, what it probably would do, I mean, I think I, I think I've already talked about this before, Scott, was I say, okay, well, we'll have it out there and say, hey, if someone orders, you know, 24 sets or whatever, you know, give them a display or how many people do you have you know, like that, and then we'll send you that many displays to send it along to the customer. Um, you know, something along those lines. And then if, um, you know, so that if they buy a certain amount, then they can just get one free, okay? Um, and then um, they have a, have a like a, a re retail price on it so they can get one, you know, separately and such. Um, so, is you know, we're definitely going to do the first thing. Beyond that, I'm not really sure how we can figure out, because we, Believe me, we want to get these displays out into the marketplace. You know, we, we definitely, um, we want to get it, um, you know, get these things out there. Because first of all, I think it's a nice display. Um, and, um, but we just have to figure out a way, the best way to do it to 
you know, you might say get more bang for your buck, but just so that they will, we know that they'll get used by people. Okay. And when do you, when do you anticipate at this point that that would be out in the marketplace? That would be with the, the, the release after the, after the Gemini, which, um, um, which <laughs> I was just talking, we were just working on, on the colors for that today, to tell you the truth. Um, and so, which probably my guess is probably end of January, early part of February. It's a little hard to tell because of the Christmas holiday over here when they shut down um, and, and, and how the other production goes and, and such. Um, um, but that's what I'm, that's what I'm looking at. Um, but it could slip into, you know, f further into February as everything always seems to, to happen. Um, um, because just, you know, they're just, you have a normal, you know, you just have a normal, you know, business because it's like, um, it, it's, it's like trying to figure out an inventory. It's kind of like driving a barge um, or like a cruise ship. You got to plan really far in advance. I mean, I was just talking yesterday. I was uh, just talking to the person in here, the general manager here, and just sort of saying that, you know, I'm noticing that in about six months time, there's going to be a, there's going to be a lot of dice we're going to be running out of. So I'm really concerned because, because normally they have a certain amount of, you know, you, you, you plan, you, you, you get a sales rate, you kind of figure out, okay, we have this much, much supply. Um, and they can make only so many dice in a month because the machine can only go so fast. Um, and, when they, and when they try to go faster, you get a lot of imperfections, a lot of mistakes, and a lot of like cracks and other kind of things. So you really can't push the, push the speed. And I was, you know, and you can make, basically make a certain amount of number of dice per month, okay? And I was noticing, kind of like with the baby boomers, um, people t look talking about healthcare and, and this and that, that in about six months time, we're going to have a lot of dice. We're going to run out of stock at one time, more than usual. And so he's talking about getting the production up so that, that we can avoid having too many out of stocks or having to do too many air freights or me, you know, saying, Oh, make this dice quickly, fast. I need this one. Oh, I need that one too. And you know, all this other kind of stuff. Um, Cause if you do that too much, what, what they do is they put a mold up on a machine and just run that mold different colors. Well, if all of a sudden you need a four side, they need an eight side, you need a 10 side, it takes about a day to change the mold. So if, you, if you're constantly having the factory change the mold, they're losing a day of production here, a day of production there, and pretty soon it's like wire running downhill, so you get, you're getting more and more out of stock of things, so you have them change it even more, then you're getting even further behind. So it's much better than put a mold up, run about 50 colors or 30 colors, then change the mold. It's much more efficient. So, so you know, I really kind of plan these things out far in advance. And uh, um, so it's something that, uh, um, that, I don't know, where, what was the original question? <laughs> uh, it was when you, when you expected the... Um, yeah, okay. The so, 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 so a lot of lab dice, it has to kind of fit in between the normal, normal stuff. But I'm, I'm thinking the... The, 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 the tubes will be out in probably the January or February release. Okay, perfect. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we got there. I could have made that a shorter answer, couldn't I? <laughs> we got it, we got it, we're good. Okay, great. Um, it looks like the questions have stopped, so um, I think we're, we're at a good stopping point as well. I, I really wanna thank you for uh, coming on with us today and, and uh, being present and, and willing to talk about your products and uh, you've got a lot of fans in our audience. So you were a, you were a huge draw. I think one of our largest attended audiences uh, for webinars. So I want to thank Don Reitz for, for taking the time out of his day from Germany uh, to do this. And then uh, also I want to thank our retail partners, all of you who showed up today. I see Chance Bartlett on there, a former customer of mine when I was in sales on at GTS. So good to see him there. And then, uh, I will return the rest of your day to you. I'm Scott Bohr. I am the uh, category manager for gaming accessories, role-playing games, and uh, miniature games. So if you have questions on any of that, please please feel free to email me. Uh, Don, do you want us to give your email address on this webinar so that people can contact you, or do you prefer that it goes well, to I mean, if they want to, it's really best to con I mean, I'm really not the person really best to contact on a lot of these things because I'm always all over the place. And like I just suddenly realized that I got an email from someone from like last Wednesday that I hadn't replied to because um, I didn't see it. But uh, um, so, um, 
it's best if you want to have any questions to, to uh, either go to contact at chessies.com or sales at chessies.com. Um, you know, contact is Lauren, L-A-U-R-E-N, and sales goes to Dustin, who's okay. like our sales manager. Yeah, we'll make sure that that gets onto the, um, the webinar when we upload this to YouTube so that it's there for any reference that needs to go back. But it's contact at chessex.com or sales at chessex.com are the emails you want to use to contact Chessex. Right, yeah, th th that's the best because, like I said, I do a, I, I travel a lot. I uh, um, um, do a lot of shows. I come to the factories. So I'm only in Fort Wayne probably maybe five, maybe six months out of the year. So I'm really the, a very poor person to contact about day-to-day -day operations because I'm really not involved in it that much because I'm, I'm away so much. Great. All right. Well, thank you once again for, for showing up. Um, I'm going to go ahead and end it here and we'll get you back to the rest of your day uh, or evening for you, Don. So have a great night uh, oh, and we'll talk to you again soon. Okay. Thanks, Thanks all. Yeah.